Hi, my name is Savannah. Welcome to Brent Locked In. Over the course of lockdown, we've been having a video interview series and talking to a lot of people from Brent that have had remarkable careers in many different fields. Today, I'm quite happy to be speaking to Ian Dewitt, who is a poet and was once named the best poet of his generation by none other than Carol Ann Duffy. So, Ian, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine, Savannah. Very, very honoured to be on this programme. Ah, oh, thank you, Ian. We're honoured to have you. And I just wanted to kind of ask you a bit about how you found the last few months with lockdown and everything. Well, it actually worked quite well for me. Um, this Zoom link is an example, really. Uh, I've continued to do readings. I've been in touch with people. And when we need to do a face to face, um, there's a couple of projects that I've started, um, uh, which I was able to take quite far, really. I mean, other people are far more disabled by not being able to get out and about than a poet is, you know. Um, you can send emails, you can work on your poetry. And in many ways, it's actually stopped me being distracted by other things. I've just had to get on with it. So I've had a pretty good lockdown, I have to admit. Oh, that's, that's good to hear, Ian. Firstly, I think to kind of kick off everything to get a good background, could you tell us a bit about where in Brent you grew up and your sort of ties to Brent um, in terms of your early childhood? Well, um, I, I grew up on uh, just over Kilburn Bridge. Um, they eventually built a very large council estate called uh, the Warwick Avenue Estate, which ran from the side of Edgware Road all the way down to Harrow Road. Um, but all my family, like my father worked in Cricklewood, for example, mm -hmm. and my sister worked in Cricklewood as well. My other sister lived in Cricklewood, and I used to go and see her a lot. Um, and I have to admit, I used to go to the pubs in Kilburn a lot, you know. <laughs> uh, at the bottom of uh, Kilburn High Road, you can get the 28 bus, which would take us to Chelsea Football Ground, mm -hmm. which was uh, very important to me in my youth, you know. Um, so we used to meet in at the Queen's Arms, which was a young house, which was the best beer in Britain. But um, it was a very, I grew up in a very, very strong Irish community. Mm. Um, and uh, the pubs in Kilburn and the uh, feeling of being in a, uh, a group, mm. uh, especially with my generation coming through, was very important. Um, I think I might have mentioned that one side of the Kilburn High Road is Camden and the other side was Brent. So the pubs would stay open at the weekend longer on one side than on the other, you know. <laughs> it's un undignified stampede across the road to get in the last orders and things like this. Um, but also, um, there was a sense that things were changing. I mean, Kilburn has certainly changed since, but there, what it meant, what was going on in Ireland changed. Yeah. Um, a very big, big deal was in 1969, uh, the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland, Bloody Sunday. Um, a lot of people in my generation became very radicalised by that. Yeah. Lots of the old, you know, the older generation, um, uh, they began to question how how welcome they felt in England. You know, on one occasion, um, you know, people used to tell used to wind up the authorities. They used to say that there was going to be a big IRA meeting on Kilburn High Road. And no, but there wasn't. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, an armoured car drove up and down Kilburn High Road, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said later on that that was for recruitment purposes. I mean, the idea that you would recruit people for the British Army uh, in 1969 on Kilburn High Road was pretty <laughs> unlikely. So it was, it, was, it was interesting. It was culturally rich. Mm -hmm. uh, traditional music, we used to see both at Chelsea Football Ground, but also if you went up to towards Arsenal, it's actually knocked down for the new ground, but the favourite has a tremendous traditional musician, a woman called Margaret Barry. Um, poetry was actually valued within the Irish community. And I think I felt lucky from that point of view. Um, you know, lots of songs, poets would write songs, so you could listen to songs which were also good poetry on Raglan Road and things like that. So it was, it was very good. Um, I had this fantasy somehow that, you know, that we were the future, that like Ireland was left behind and that was in the past and that Kilburn was going to be the future. But of course, Kilburn changed beyond 
recognition mm. and, and we left. Um, so we didn't realize that we were a blip on a much longer timeline. Um, such was our arrogance. Um, so it was very interesting. It was, it was not all good, but by the same token, there was a lot of goodness in it. Yeah. Um, and I've never forgotten that. I think uh, going back to what you was touching on there about the Irish community, um, can you remember, I guess, sort of any particular standout moments for you where the Irish community had to come together during those times or even just even like iconic Irish figures that were in the community at that time that you can tell us a bit about? Well, I have to tell you, well, this is, this is not entirely serious, but it was a lot of fun. Um, there was a bloke called Butty Sagro, who was a landlord of a pub. I actually worked in as a barman for a while. And he persuaded one of his um, barmen, called Mick Meaney, to be buried alive. Uh, for, this is for the world record. It was like 65 or 66 days underground, you know. Wow. And there was this sort of big procession on a builder's yard. I'm sure this was in 1969, um, uh, on the, a, to a builder's yard with Mick in his coffin. In. <laughs> It's amazing. Oh and he buried him. Health and safety would not allow it now. Um, <laughs> you know, like a lorry reversed over his oxygen pipe and things like this. That was happening all of the time because the building yard was still active, you know. Wow. Um, uh, and they linked him up with an American who was also going for the uh, record. And Mick used to F and blind and abuse people when he was live on air. I mean, it was a lot of fun, you know. <laughs> It was a lot of fun for the TV people. Uh, but, I mean, like, this was, I wrote about it again recently. In fact, I was in touch with a relative of Mix when he went back to Ireland. Mm. Um, but everybody would, cut. They, you know, the more bizarre, the better. Um, uh, and Butty Sagru also, for a while in Kilburn, he came from Kilorbin in Ireland, but they have a very famous puck fair. Mm. And it's called the puck fair because they have a puck goat on a platform sort of overseeing the events, you know. Once again, that wouldn't be allowed now. But it was very, very pagan. Uh, it was like, you know, it was like a sort of demonic black mass figure almost. Mm -hmm. But he did the same in Kilburn with a buck overseeing what was uh, going on in Kilburn. Um, so there were characters like him. Uh, Butty Sagru was incredibly strong. He used to do things like, um, one of his tricks was he would hold a motorbike uh, attached to uh, a rubber wedge in his teeth and the motorbike would rev and try and drive off, you know. Gosh. Uh, he later went on to organise um, a boxing match in Dublin between um, uh, Muhammad Ali and Al Blue Lewis, you know. And so he did, he was a real mover and a shaker. So he was the most spectacular individual figure. Um, but there was, friends of mine were significant to me, I suppose, in a much smaller way. Uh, we used to go and watch Chelsea, and there was a Chelsea right back called Paddy Mulligan, uh, and because he was Irish. Everybody from Kilburn would stand under the Yi at the shed. There were all these big letters around the shed, uh, which was the Chelsea end. And we'd always say, I see you under the Yi, you know. And we also go to Paddy Mulligan cheered loudly whenever he got the ball and all the rest of it, you know. Because football is now a multinational game, millionaires. Uh, you don't really get Chelsea, you know, Irish players playing for Chelsea in the same way that you did then. Yeah. Um, but within all of this, songs and music, uh, at the White Hart near the football ground, you heard wonderful, wonderful musicians and singers. And as I say, singing poetry. So that was important to me in that way as well. Let's talk a bit about, I guess, your parents' journey to Brent. Did your parents move directly from Ireland to Brent or was there a bit of movement around different places before they settled in Brent? Well, my father moved over first. Uh, okay. He was in the Irish army, um, but um, they, they were country people. They came from a very small uh, village called Emley. And my mother came from just inside Limerick, the uh, uh, hospital, but there was no work around there. So although my father, was a successful soldier. He was um, a sergeant major. He was um, an expert with weapons of all sizes, from handguns through to light artillery. That doesn't really fit you for civilian life, mm -hmm. uh, particularly not in a neutral country. So he came over to London first, 
it, there was links with people who'd already gone over there. Uh, he found work and then he eventually found accommodation to ship the family over. And we never really moved, you know. The first place we lived in was at one end of Lanark Road, one end of this big estate. Uh, and then later on, where we lived was, it was a slum. It was part of a slum clearance and then that was knocked down and we moved to another part of the estate. But we stayed in that area of Kilburn. Uh, he worked for a long time at the Express Dairy in Triplewood, all Irish. I worked there myself for a time, you know. And it was a good place to grow up. There was a pub called The Crown in Cricklewood, and that was like a labour exchange if you worked on the building sites. Um, people, they used to cash checks. If you were paid by a check, they would cash them there. If you were looking for work, you would go there. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of building going on at the time, uh, including the M1, um, oh, wow. which, you know, the, you know, the Kilburn High Road almost ran into the M1. Yeah. Um, I, could, I could hitch to Leeds, uh, and leads back to London and be dropped off outside my parents' house faster than if I got a train, you know. Oh, People yeah. don't really hitch anymore, it's a bit dangerous, but it was, in terms of getting around, it was a very easy way to get around. I read that you are one of 11 um, siblings, yeah. so but, I mean, what was that like growing up? Because I mean, <laughs> that is literally so many people to be around as you're growing up, so how did that sort of, I guess, shape you into the man you are today? Well, you get used to, you, we ate in shifts. We didn't all eat at the same time. Yeah. And there was also, there was quite a, a, an age difference between me and my older brothers and sisters. My eldest brothers were as old as most of my friends' parents. Mm. What was supposed to be a big issue at the time was the generation gap. Yeah. But for me, that wasn't quite the same thing because the generation of parents were my brothers. So... I always knew the naughty things that other people's parents got up to. I always had that connection, you know. But I suppose I had a sense with, with older brothers that were a lot older than me. Yeah. I, I had a, an insight into older generations mm. that other people from a smaller family wouldn't have. Yeah. I think now, if you've only got a few brothers and sisters, your parents' generation, there's a cut-off. It's a different world. Everything they thought and did was completely separate. For me, I might go to the pub and see my friend's parents there or something like that. Or, you know, there wasn't that um, cut off. So I had a big spread, an intimate spread of knowledge over several decades uh, to call on as I was growing up. So you think being around, I guess, how, like you said, having that sort of um, close, older generation around you growing up, do you feel like it, in a sense, like made you mature quicker in that you always had people around you that you know could share wisdom and stuff like that yes you i mean you you began thinking about adult concerns very early mm. um and you thought about serious things you know like what are you going to you know what is it like when you leave school what is it yeah. like when you do these jobs um and i could see the limitations to be perfectly honest of culture um, and I, I got interested in new things. Not that far from Kilburn, mm. you can walk to Hampstead Heath, which yeah. I used to do just for a walk every day. I used to walk there. And then I came to um, Kenwood House, um, which had marvellous paintings. You know, mm. I, got, I began to get interested in that because of that. It started off as just a bit of a walk. Yeah. And I went in and they had this wonderful self-portrait by Rembrandt. Uh, it's a famous one. Um, and I remember counting all of the different colours he'd used on his face. And I think, you know, how, I think he used something like 27 different colours on wow. his face. And about 13 on his nose alone, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the first time I realised that you stood, when you moved close to a painting and you stood back, it changed. Things yeah. changed. And the artist was taking that into account. It was a moving, it was a moving work of art. It wasn't just like what you saw in magazines, you know. There was a Vermeer uh, of a guitar player, a woman playing the guitar, um, but full of mystery, you know. And I suppose it, it struck me as a little bit like poetry because you didn't have the full story. Mm. Something was going on. She was perhaps um, 
distracted or someone had come in uh, and that was all you needed to know yeah uh, and in a way that kind of fed into poetry it wasn't like stories it wasn't like films where you went through a whole narrative you had glimpses of something fascinating glimpses this is significant and this is all you will see of it this yeah. is a significant moment um rendered in the most wonderful way um, and I, I wouldn't have got that except from where I lived. I then started walking to other art galleries. There was one not that far from us in Hyde Park, uh, the Serpentine Gallery. Mm. They had poetry readings as well as contemporary art. Some of the um, art I saw when I was a teenager in the Serpentine Gallery, I never forgot. Mm. Uh, a poet called Ian Hamilton Finley was also a sculptor. When I had a job recently, uh, I was writing poems that would be put in installations around the a stately home, you know. Yeah. Um, and I remembered, I remembered seeing him there, you know. Um, you could walk, I mean, I went to the National Gallery later on, but all of these places were in walking distance for me. Um, and Brent and Kilburn had some fascinating old houses, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm only smiling because I was thinking of Sickert, Walter Sickert, the painter who described Venice as Kilburn on the sea, you know, which I thought was a fantastic description. I read that your mum used to recite poetry to you yeah. as a child. So is firstly, is that what got you into wanting to become a poet? And also, are there any sort of standout poems you remember your mum telling you about that still like, stick with you to this day? Well, she, I suppose what I got from it was, first of all, not to be embarrassed about it. That, you know, mm -hmm. she was, poetry was something that grown-ups did, you know. Yeah. So not something that you need to grow out of, you know. It wasn't just something that you did at school. It was something that could to stay with you. She used to know poems. There was one by Mangan that stuck in my mind because it, like, had a social conscience, you know. Woman with three cows. It's very sarcastic. But the bit, you know, the verse which I never forgot was, good luck to you, don't scorn the poor, and don't be their despiser. For worldly wealth soon melts away and cheats the very miser, you know. And there was a sense of um, people who had money were not better than you. They only had it for a while. And if they didn't know what to do with it, then they were poorer than you, you know, um, that you have to obey. And with a poem, you haven't got that much time you haven't got that much space. So if you can do something which implies greater depth, yes, that's what a poem can do. You can suggest things and then just leave the suggestion. But it often seems to me that poetry is closer to song or to film mm. than it, the novels. The language is, is the event. Um, and if the language is interesting, it makes for a good poem. And for you as well, like, is there any sort of, I guess, memories you have as, in, as a child or even early adolescence that you can remember like writing poetry and thinking, do you know what, maybe this is something I want to pursue? Um, yes. Uh, this is going to sound peculiar, but then again, lots of things that do sound peculiar. I used to look at the underground um, and I would sometimes I'd look at adverts sometimes or I would hear songs mm. in adverts and I thought, I could do that, you know. I could make a better advert. I could make a funnier joke. I could uh, make a song a bit more interesting. Um, and I would play, I enjoyed playing with words in that way. Um, and I think probably for lots of poets, a sense of play with language is important, you know. Um, with traditional songs, of course, putting new words to the tunes is very normal, you know. Mm -hmm. so, that was the first thing I did really. Before I actually wrote poetry, I would, um, you know, write songs, new words for songs, uh, which I've been doing ever since really. Mm -hmm. um, but somebody said that um, advertising jingles were the new folk songs. Um, and to a certain extent, football crowds would do that. I mean, Paddy Mulligan, we would take uh, an advert and change it so that we could chant Paddy Mulligan's name or something. Football crowds still do it, you know. Mm -hmm. Songs and adverts that have long since been forgotten are remembered on the terraces, you know, they have a new life. So, so that's all around you as well. So owning forms of language, um, owning music by making it your own, by changing it, 
that was quite natural when we grew up, you know. You didn't need to come from a rich family to sort of feel that um, music and poetry could be available to you. Or yeah. at least that was my experience. Literally to take that on board. And for you as a poet and as a creator, what do you have any particular, I guess, characteristics or um, structures you feel are important to have in your poems to, I guess, develop that connection with the reader and also just to make them great? I have to say that the influence of song on my poetry is quite significant. Um, yeah. That they, they're more formal than is perhaps fashionable uh, anymore. Um, I have quite a lot of them, I do use rhyme. I do use features that are recognisable to people who listen to songs a lot. Mm. Um, uh, a lot of them could be very easily set to music. A lot of the ones yeah. I'm writing at the moment could be very easily set to music. Um, I'm working with a, a young woman of uh, Chinese heritage, Jennifer Lee Tsai at the moment. We're looking at the racialization of epidemics. Um, mm. Uh, it, it, I mean, it's very early days yet, but we're involved with a person doing research uh, socially as well. And the whole project is called From Irish Fever to Wuhan Flu. Um, Irish fever was what they called typhus back in the 19th century. Mm. And the Irish were regarded as bringing this disease, uh, which they were, uh, you know, they suffered enormously from the yeah. disease. But they brought the disease because of the famine in Ireland. And because they weren't supported in Ireland, they had no choice. They came to yeah. England, and after that, or you died, you know. Um, if you think about Trump trying to make um, COVID uh, blame China for it, you yeah. know, come flu, that sort of thing, you know. Yeah. Um, so the idea is that we will write poems um, tracing this connection. It's almost bookended, you know, the Irish... Uh, in the 19th century and the Chinese now. Mm. Um, so we, we are looking to create, but in the context of an argument, if as it were, uh, a social concern. Um, and although people might not necessarily think that epidemiology is something that poets would uh, have anything to say about, I think we do. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, poets can... You know, the world is available to us, you know, if yeah. we choose to look, you know, we must let the world in. Mm -hmm. We must let the outside world in. And I don't just mean the flowers and the birds and the trees, wonderful as they are, you know. Um, everything needs to go in. And politics and justice, um, the bad as well as the good. Yeah. Poetry has to sort through that. Um, well, I don't have to tell you that. You know, um, but that would be an example of, of really how something like this developed. And I suppose within that, um, part of what I'm doing is the idea that my forms are always meant to be catchy, which is almost like an epidemiological pun, you know. Yeah. You might talk about a song being infectious or an infectious tune, you know. And it is in the same way. Um, and I'm playing with those ideas. Jennifer... Um, uh, is doing it in a different way. Um, she's looking at like, an she has an immense sophisticated um, linguistic grasp. I was talking to her about the tones in Chinese. You know, Cantonese, which is what she speaks, has uh, seven tones, but she talks about her father and he comes from Guangzhou. And although they speak Cantonese, they have five tones. Uh, very musical. Each of these tones can dramatically change the meaning of what you're saying, you know. And so that in itself, those tones are like layers in language. Yeah. Um, she's just doing it in a slightly different way. Um, when I worked in York, um, I was responsible for a hostel uh, where in the area where the Irish uh, came over, Black 47 it was called, which was the worst year of the famine. Um, and I came to know through local stories, there was a terrifying figure who was the undertaker, uh, Billy Wayman, you know, and I've written about him too. So you can then go from the individual into the general, but Billy Wayman used to follow people around in the pub. And if someone coughed, he started measuring them up, you know. <laughs> uh, and then later on in the time of Spanish flus, it was then called 
he put a sign in his window saying, sail now on, you know. And it was just like, within all of the horror, there was these individuals that brought a sort of macabre sense of humour to the situation as well. Yeah. You know? But that's about knowing the individual as well as the general, being alert to the larger patterns, but, you know, talking to people around you, uh, finding out what it was like for individuals and the individuals that were involved in all of this. Mm-hmm. You know? And again, I think poetry does that very well. If we have someone watching this interview today who writes poetry, who's maybe even considering getting into it as a career, what advice would you give them? Read as much as you possibly can, not just within your own tradition. Read outside it. Um, So that's first and foremost. Very often people say things like, oh, I'm worried about spoiling my unique approach, you know. Well, how do you know your approach is unique until you've found out what other people are doing, you know? I mean, if you went to your doctor and your doctor said, well, I don't read medicine books because I don't want to spoil the purity of my bedside manner, you'd never go back to that doctor. (laughs) It's true. Read a lot. Um, A lot of it is now available on the internet. Make good use of the internet. Um, Go to the Poetry Library in London, um, join the Poetry Society, but also the Poetry Foundation in America. You can get free newsletters from them. Um, They're very, very rich. Ruth Lilly left millions in their will. So um, their editors tend to take seriously that it's the English language. Mm -hmm. So they are interested in poetry around the world. Many other people Mm -hmm. and groups can be helpful and supportive um, but good use of the internet read a lot think a lot that that will be where i would stand you know it's an it's an important thing to do find out about where you've come from i mean really find out about it you know mm-hmm. um, you see i suppose what i mean about other brothers and sisters there was nothing was off limits yeah when I was finding out where we come from you know um don't imagine that things that are happening for you is the way it will always be. Mm. Like me and Kilburn. I thought Kilburn would be the way it was when I grew up forever. It, it isn't. It changed dramatically, and Kilburn is wonderful in a different way now. Brent is wonderful yeah. in a different way now. You know, you're feeding yourself constantly, your mind. Sometimes it might take you decades mm-hmm. for things to fall, fall into place and make sense. You know, take yourself seriously. Have a notebook. If something occurs to you, put it in a notebook. Later on, it might go into a poem. Lots of poets have notebooks that they look at for their whole lives. You yeah. know? So kind of take yourself seriously as a poet um, and a poet in a larger world um, and enjoy it, you know, and allow it to enrich your life. Um, it does. If you allow it to enrich your life, you will end up writing the sort of poetry that enriches other people's mm. lives and they will want to read that. As I always say to people, it's from Johnson, nothing can be useless to a poet. He says in one of his poems, Rasselas, nothing can be useless to the poet. All around you, don't scorn what is around you. Anything which is near you could make great poetry. You know, you are rich in inspiration wherever you are. You don't need money to be inspired. Mm. Leave it I could go on oh, thank you so much Ian thank you um, to everyone watching first and foremost thank you for tuning in I hope you enjoyed my chat with Ian today there was a lot of gems in there so make sure you take note of everything he said um, in order to watch our interviews you can find us all on LBOC 2020 on Instagram and Facebook and Ian I want to give you a chance to also promote yourself so for anyone watching right now where can they find you and my last book is The Blind Road Maker uh, it's with Picador um, and that's probably the easiest uh, place for people to start. Um, I'm on the Poetry Archive as well. Um, so if you uh, Google me, you can find out probably quite a lot. Um, another thing I say to people who are writing poetry now is get good examples of your work on the internet. Mm. Because what I'm saying now is if you want to find out about me, look me up on the internet. That's what everybody does. If I hear about another person and I want to find out about them, I will look them up on the internet. So think of internet publishing as well, which has been very significant. Anyway. Oh, thank you so much, Ian. Thank you so much for the chat today. It's been amazing. Thank you.